thank you. Are we good? Uh, Connor, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Get off stuff. Yeah? Yeah. Technical stuff. You know all about it over the next couple of days, lads. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you prefer the couch on Ireland AM or? What? Do you prefer the couch on Ireland AM? What was the colour of the couch there? No, I think. That's the same colour of those seats. These are beautiful couches. Colour really tight around together. Um, so yeah, um, Mark is a is uh, I suppose it's the embodiment of the spirit of what we're hoping will be uh, um, a, a huge component in a lot of films is uh, somebody who just went out and did it, you know, especially for his, his, his first film more particularly um, in terms of uh, I mean, Star Wars was your first film, right? No, between, between the canals, excuse me, yeah, yeah. So between the canals was exactly that. Um, I know there was a big gap in between shooting that as well. So it's a really good example of not taking no for an answer and just uh, continuing on down the road and doing exactly what you need to do to get the film done, finished, and over the line. Uh, Mark is also, am I right in saying this? You've, you've street cast some parts and stuff as well, haven't you? You've street cast. Street, like, oh, street cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. literally street cast yeah. uh, films. Um, Taxi cast. Yeah, shop. Yeah, yeah, which anyone, <laughs> anyone's gonna be in. It. First of all, how are you doing? How am I? Good. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah. Enjoying the day's nice, proceedings. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, amazing. It's yeah. great to be here at this festival, like to support it and to just be a part of it. It's brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. It's um, the weather's not helping today, but I know that there are quite a few people who are very uh, slyly out shooting already, and uh, there's some people that have been planning this for weeks, um, so. What I'd say as well, guys, is if, if you know, uh, share on social media what's happening here, you know, tag FastFest, invite people to come down even tomorrow, uh, even on Sunday as well, the more the merrier, everyone is, is welcome to take part, and we'll have an excellent screening at the end of all of this. Um, hopefully in the Lighthouse, screen, uh, Lighthouse Cinema, which we're just waiting to confirm over the next few days. Um, Mark, what, why did you want to become a filmmaker? Oh, jeez. Um well, going back, my uncle was a filmmaker back in the 60s, um, but I didn't know that until I was, you know, older, uh, so that wasn't the reason. <laughs> no, my, well, actually, the, the, the start of it was um, when I was about 10 years old, my brother brought me down to his friend's house, Richard Joyce, and he had a camera, and oh, it started with, he started watching films, so they were kind of like five or six years older than me, and they were watching uh, Warriors and... Uh, Rambo First Blood and like different films that I wasn't supposed to be watching, I wasn't allowed to watch, but I was allowed there, I could watch them there. So um, <clears throat> I thought this was amazing. Um, and then Richard had a, had a camera, so we shot a little short film. It was a horror thing where uh, I played the butler and um, I remember I had to like sit behind the couch and we tied string to a handbag and I had to pull the handbag up like it was moving by itself. So that was kind of the very, very initial seed. Um, my brother was obsessed with films, um, so his DVD collection eventually, when, when I was a teenager, he was, it was like, you know, a thousand DVDs and he'd always be walking up the stairs and, and trying to get me to come down to watch stuff, like, and I'd always be sitting on the, the computer trying to write something and just, you know, because I was trying to make stuff and um, he'd be like, come on down, watch a film, watch it. and I'd be like, yeah, two minutes, two minutes, you know. Yeah. So I just started um, writing, like, little, just very basic, uh, chase sequences or little stories. Before that I was just writing little stories and then um, I didn't have a camera, we didn't have cam uh, so one of my friends uh, that lived a couple of miles away, he had a camera so he said he'd give me a lens of his camera and I cycled to his house every probably couple of months and, I, and he gave it to me for the weekend and it was like one of those, you know, I think it was like a eight millimeter, the little ones, you know. Yeah. Um, and I just started making short films and involving friends, you know, and, and they started becoming my act, the actors in, in the films. And then that just, you know, kind of evolved like that. Are they still acting or are they on career No, no. <laughs> they weren't into the acting. It took, like, one of the films we made was a 20 minute film called Dubs, and it took me about four years to make it because they kept not turning up. Like, there was about 30 people that I knew, like friends and family. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, it was just so hard to get it finished. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, 
when, at what point did you realise that, okay, I only got so far with dubs and it took me 17 years to make it, um, do, I, do, did you feel as if you needed to get a bit of training in order to take things to the next level? Because um, I know you studied in New York, didn't you? Um, yeah, like, I, I didn't even know, like, to be honest, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just making films. I didn't know that there was any career or, you know, anything to do with film. I didn't know you could study that in college. I was just making shorts and I, I ended up making about 60, like, just short films. And then at some point, one of my friends, because uh, I was, I was going to do business, you know, like, because I didn't know what else I was going to do. And one of my friends, this one was like 16 or so, one of, them, one of them said, you can do media studies in Dunleary. So I said, oh, I'm interested in that, you know. So I think I went to do that. Um, I didn't get in the first year. And my sister was working in the theatre in town, in the SFX theatre. So she got me in there and I was working in stage and up in the, you know, the light, lights and stage and stuff like that. <clears throat> the second year, then I got into media studies, did media studies. And then I got into uh, Ballyfermot and did, did two years of film at Ballyfermot. Ballyfermot. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was what valuable lessons did you take from your time in college in terms of um, that informs what you do now? Um, I, I think this, the time outside of college is more valuable, actually. Like you know, so um, zero. Yeah. To be honest, <laughs> you know, now, like New York Film Academy was good because you got you got to actually make the films. You know, in, in like three months, you got to make four films, but. Bally Firma, like nice teachers and everything, but it was two years of not doing much, just standing around, you know. Um, whereas I preferred the guerrilla style of indie filmmaking with, with friends and, and then other people in the industry. Um, so, you know, and then I went back to college years later uh, after I did Between the Canals and King of the Travelers and just did a master's in screenwriting because I just felt I wanted to, you know, learn the craft of that, you know, because I hadn't learned that growing up, you know. Yeah. You know, so I wanted to know more. So what you felt, not necessarily, uh, you, you, even though you were competent on it, you felt as if you wanted more control over it. Yeah, I felt like I didn't process. know the craft of, of writing, like the structure, you know, because Between the Canals was a first draft and I wrote it in three, three weeks and I ended up making that, you know. And when I look at it now, it's like there's a lot of mistakes, there's things that could be better, you know. That other people don't realise and don't notice, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Has anyone seen Between the Canals? So it's a it's a brilliant movie from how many years in the time? Twelve. Twelve thirteen. Yeah, about twelve years. Yeah. yeah. So Peter Peter Killen, that was one of Peter's first. Yeah, his roles, right? Peter, uh, his first. Um, Barry Keoghan's first. Uh, Clinchy, who was in Love Hate. Uh, Stephen Jones. Uh, Robbie Walsh. The, yeah, that was all their first film. Yeah, launch pad for everyone. Um, so what did you learn from that process that you? brought into the next film that you had, working with uh, John Connors and Barry and obviously Barry Keoghan. Um, I just like kept that, like the indie mindset of going and doing it, and that's why I love this, the idea of this festival, just going and doing it. It's the thing that is the most important part of the industry, because even when you get to make a big project with a big money, like, you know, you've done it and then what are you going to do next? You have to continue going on and that applies to like when you're writing a script, getting it done, you know, getting the notes, moving forward all the time. It's, it's up to you to kind of, to push on and, and so even with Between the Canals, like I was turned down for funding for Between the Canals and myself and Peter went out and we went to the flats and we shot a scene on a little cam, you know, mini DV camera and um, we went into the meeting then and I was sitting in a meeting with the film board at the time and they were about to tell us why we didn't have funding and I said can you just can we just show you something on the laptop and we showed them the scene that we just shot, shot so you have to make people believe in what you're doing you know and that's kind of like funding funders are, are cast uh, you know producers uh, everybody and you have to do it yourself and, 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 and uh, bring a great team together passionate people who, who are passionate about film as well. <laughs> Yeah. So, just to, to bring it back to Stalker, Paul just touched on it there with Barry Hogan and, and John Connors. That movie, interesting enough, was shot predominantly on a five on Canon 5D, I believe, or a 70 5D? Yeah, 5, 5D. So there would be a lot of people here that are involved in the kind of Kino short film movement as well, and nearly all of those films are made on DSLRs. And that's a movie that was in multiple international film festivals and won one or two awards at the festivals, and it was made on a DSLR. So it's a great example of, I suppose, in, uh, 
the ingenuity to just go and do it. And with Stalker, were you fun? You were funded for Stalker a bit. There was a bit of funding for Stalker, I believe. Uh, no, no, we we did uh, Stalker. It was it was Ireland's first like crowdfunded yes crowdfunded campaign. campaign did you? Um, we, we raised kind of 15,000 uh, over the course of about six weeks, you know, through a true um, reward system um, that you can do. Um, and then we shot it in 11 days. Um, and yeah, like that, that camera was, was great, you know. The, the only thing was the focus, you know, when you're kind of doing handheld stuff, it kind of the focus goes in and out, so you're, you're missing bits. But then, like, the cameraman was like, oh, that's, it's French, you know. So, <laughs> So I was like, okay, if it's French, let's, let's it must, go with it. It must have been a very organic shooting experience with that film because obviously from watching it, you can see there's a lot of just natural what natural light use, whatever is available. So it must have been a very kind of, uh, not run and gun particularly, like this, the time pressure that these guys are under, but that it was from location. It, it, you, I, can I could tell anyway when I saw it, um, that it was uh, very natural in, in it, the way you produced it. it it's, it looks like the, there wasn't huge setups or anything like that. It was like, I'm not surprised you did it in 11 days, I didn't know it was that short. But was, is, is there a certain, for you as a director, there's obviously an authenticity running through your work, but do you find that, let's say if you're doing a, a film now where you have like the full works, where you have uh, trailers of, of uh, cameras and all that behind you, do you find that maybe in a way limits what your natural instinct of, of shooting quickly or shooting kind of more naturally? Yeah, like that's a really good question. It definitely does. Once the, if the crew gets big, uh, everything gets restricted. So, like say for instance on, on Cardboard Gangsters, we had the bigger crew. We we had time restrictions with you know with days and stuff. And I remember we had a, a laneway see, scene for instance, and uh, it was just after lunch. And the first AD was saying, "Okay, we've got like twenty minutes. We got to shoot this scene." And we'd already just done a laneway scene. <laughs> and, and so I kind of said to the, to the DP, Michael Lavelle, um, why don't we just quickly have a, have a look around for another location where we can do this. And we went out onto Darndell Green and we found loads of tyres that were on fire on the green. And we said, why don't we shoot the scene through the fire, like, you know, through the smoke. And Michael was like, yeah, cool. Like, and if you have a cameraman like that, it's amazing, you know, that someone is on the same page. So we said it to the AD and he was like, no, no, guys, we don't have the time. Come on, come on. Said, okay, we'll do it. We ran down, brought the crew down, and we shot a trip. Like, and I think visually it's probably the best scene in the film now, you know. So you have to be willing to, you know, to be able to move things around. Um, would you say constrained? Hard? Would constrained be a word when you're when you're dealing with an actual fully budgeted movie and with, as you said, ads and people doing location and timekeeping? Because when I saw Harry Gangsters, I was like, this is definitely a Mark Connor film, but it's it's it is a movie of yours, but there's a different. Uh, uh, there's a, not a different aesthetic really, uh, but it, there's a different kind of feeling from, from that movie to, to your previous films. Would you agree? Um, I suppose, uh, um, well I, I think um, when, the, when the crew is bigger, if there's more money, everything gets more restricted and then you're trying to fight with like the producers and there's even people above the producers and then they're coming to set making sure that you know, it has to be done this way. So. Yeah, so to be honest, like my favorite budget is the zero budget. Aha, see guys, this is the, you guys are in the they're in look for the That's weekend. like the best type of film that you can have is a zero budget because then everybody's in it for the passion and there's no restrictions. You can do anything you want. Obviously, you have to reverse engineer your idea. So if you're coming up with an idea for a film, it's good. You got to think, okay, I've got a coffee shop here. I've got like with Stalker, we have a park here. I live in Ranelagh, so let's shoot it in Ranelagh, you know what I mean? So you have to reverse reverse engineer your idea like that um, when you, if it's a feature film, I think. But a short, I think you've got a bit more scope and free, uh, freedom, you know? Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, so when you're limited in terms of locations, or if it's pissing rain, like okay, it has been all day today, I don't know what it's going to be like tomorrow, how would you adapt, or how, how do you think on your feet? You know, what do you do? Do you, like do you do you radically change your plans? Like it's like what you said there about kind of shooting through the fire and everything like that. Or do you do you, like do you go off on your own and have like a Jerry Seinfeld th Seinfeld moment where you recalibrate on your own, or do you have do you have a mind mapping session with your producer and DOP? And how do you how do you then express that? How important is communication then in that moment with dealing with crew and stuff? Um, the control has usually been taken off you earlier on before you actually get to the set if you're in that situation of 
the bigger set and the bigger production and producers who are who are kind of you know trying to oversee your thing and tell you like so you've got a committee of people and you're you're constantly fighting for that and you're trying to rewrite the script in the evening and they're trying to lock the script and say you can't touch that script like they'll you know so you have these when when you're talking for a big thing and especially when it's for television and it's for you know because they're so scared that you're going to put something in or you're going to change something that's not going to work on screen and you know i suppose like i i didn't have a history of making loads of television at a big scale so when I made Darklands, it was the first time of doing a six-part, you know, show. So, so like, good, ex good experience, different uh, experience. Yeah, like very good experience, but but difficult, you know. Um, you know, but you learn, you learn from it, you know. Um, and um, so you're you're kind of fighting battles, you know, with, with that. Um, and I just got to the point where like it has, something had to be rewritten because if it's not working on set and. So the continuity be ringing the producer like he's changing the lines again. He's, he's, off, he's off again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but you have to do it. You know, if you want it to, if you see, if like if you believe in what you're doing, you know, and, and you just have to be really believe in in, in, in what you're doing. How do you deal with that? How do you sweet talk these people that want to tell you to do something else? Um, you just say, uh, okay, and then you just you know, do, do it anyway. <laughs> Um, no, you try. No, you try to get along with everything. You know, you, you have to. You have to. But but again, you have to stick to your vision. You have to like stick to it. You know, as much as you can. Yeah. You know. How important are collaborators in, in this? Yeah, it's, it's it's everything. You know, like your collaboration with your writers, direct co-writer, director. Uh, you know, actors. Um, you know, and, and I I like to really collaborate with actors. Like my my favorite thing is performance because. I really got into drama, like the film stuff was kind of just for fun on the side, but drama was really for my mother when I was a kid, like her bringing me to the theatre, that's when I was really like, you know, this is like so invigorating, you know, and I was in, I remember being in school and the drama teacher came in, we hadn't done drama, it was like fourth class or something, and he just set up this scene where we had to do, you know, some improv or whatever, and I just got such a buzz from that, so it was, it's the performance part that I love, and I suppose, and that's how I started off with filmmaking. It was all about the performance, and then I, I, I tried to incorporate visuals then as I kind of progress. So it's all all about the character and the story. At the, yeah, at the core for me, it's about it perform story. You know, idea, story, work out the structure. You want to make sure that you have a really good structure to your script and it's well developed. You know, obviously if it's if it's fast, you know, quickly, you, you, you won't have time. But um, and then performed well um, and. and um, Collaboration with everybody is key as well, yeah. With, with your DP and you know, just spending time making sure you know storyboards are important, shot lists, you know. Um, you don't have to do every shot, but it's good to have a rough, you know, try and get as much coverage as you can. Yeah. yeah uh, well, well, no, like sometimes you can do just do two or three takes, but some, but then if you've got a problem with a shot, like if you're doing a oneer, you might have fifteen takes. So it it it. Well, I just go until you get it, yeah. until you get the scene. Once you get it, you just move on. So it's always the last take, you know. What about casting and actors? Like, what is it you look for in actors? Or what should directors be looking for in an actor? Or I'm not going to say actress because we're all actors now, you know. So what are you looking for in a performer or in a performance in your, in, in your work? Um, I think, like, I think actors are just like they're fascinating in, in the way that they can just kind of step outside their own skin and that's what Shimmy was talking about earlier just thought that that was fascinating because he really was hitting the nail in the head there when he was speaking about what what that is to perform and, 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 and how we can all do it but it's very hard to do that you know um, so like that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for like stripping away all the all of that and, and a revealing of just pure honesty in, in the moment uh, showing the soul, like you know, and, and being real, and um, so like I like realism, you know. Um, but then again, you know, sometimes you can have really performs, you know, with lines said in a particular way that have just got this power as well. So it's kind of like it's social realism is one side where it's like a Ken Loach and an Alan Clark film, and it's so believable and real, it's almost like documentary film. But then you've got you know Breaking Bad where. You've got Walter White delivering a line, and it's just so perfection, you know. And it's it's written; it's, you can tell it's written, but it's very it's powerful because of his persona and his, his, his presence on screen. So there's various different ways, I think, as well to, to do it, you know. And screenwriting, 
because everybody obviously struggles with you know getting from what's in there down there. Like how how is that process for you? How do you gravitate an idea to put it on page and then get it up on its feet? Yeah, like I think every single idea that you, is is different for me personally. So. Um, some, some I would work with co-writers other on my own, but the development process tends to, to, to almost evolve depending on the project. So you might start with an idea, and it's good to have an idea thematically. Like so, instead of saying, "Okay, I'm going to make a comedy set in Cork," and then you're going to start attaching things to it, it's not going to have a root. It's not going to have something that's really, you know, an identity. So it's much better to have something that's personal to you and everybody has has ideas because everyone has their own stories and, and families and weird things or people they've met so if, if you have that it, it becomes much much stronger as an idea because there's a core element to it and then you evolve that idea into a synopsis you know you think who's the character you you, you write out their traits you write out the flaw and, and then as that develops into a synopsis then I, what I do is a one pager and then you're developing and if it's a feature film you might like you know, do a three-act structure thing. You might do a treatment of ten pages, and then and then you write the script. You know, you, you don't really want to just go straight into writing the feature script because you'll end up veering off in different directions, and um, it, it'll be very difficult to change it after you've written it. It's very hard to go back and restructure something. Yeah, if you're like ninety pages in, and you've written yourself down in a, an alley, yeah, a blind alley with something. It's um, very hard because you kind of you cement things in your head. And it's hard to go back and, 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 and you know, change. Have you, have you done that? Yeah, lots of times, you know. I've written scripts that never got made, and so I'm always, like, I've always got, like, ten different feature scripts on the go, and you just have to kind of go with, with the one that's getting traction or the one that you're really passionate about. Um, what is it about um, a certain type of character that um, appears a lot in your work, like working-class characters, con conflicted working-class or um, elements of criminality. What is it about that that life that appeals to you? Conflicted, uh, particularly young men who are um, you know on the wrong side of the tracks now, dealing with the morality of, of, of their circumstances a lot of time. There seems to be a reluctance, uh, uh, you know, an anti-hero vibe to a lot of your leads in your films who are drawn into it but can't, ultimately can't get away from the existential kind of fate of, what their, of their circumstances. Yeah. What is it about that that appeals to you? Is that a, is that a conscious thing or are you just always rooting for someone, the anti-hero, to you know, you know, ultimately save themselves but it never happens? Yeah, like uh, you're, you're right and I don't know why, um, it's, it's, I suppose you do things that you're passionate about and then as you do more stuff something just emerges and you're like, uh, well, that works. Yeah, like, uh, and, and, and it's weird because before I did Between the Canals, I like doing shorts and like there was some horror films and some comedies, but then then Between the Canals was like crime drama and then I ended up like getting into this like crime world. But like I, I am fascinated, to be honest, in criminology, you know, and uh, and the dark side of humanity, even though it's, it's, it's kind of not a nice territory sometimes and you have to be careful about like going too dark. So... But like why people do certain things, you know, like I am, I am, I'm, I'm always asking that question, like how someone could do something, you know, like, like, like so, so terrible or so bad or, so I, I get interested in those stories and I just naturally gravitate towards that, I don't know why. And you know. um, would you kind of agree that in a way there's a definitely a documentary element to your films, even though obviously they're not documentary, but there's a certain realism. And was it by chance that you went for that kind of, you're going for this kind of social realism in your films in the early ones anyway? Uh, bet uh, between the canals and well, not so much stalker, but that there's a kind of a how would I put it like nearly like you know you have like neo realism, Italian neo realism that your your cinema that you created is kind of like a new realism for like Ireland after the Celtic Tiger, like when between the canals came out, which was literally the 2008 financial crash shortly after 2009 or 10, I think. Yeah. So you know, a kind of a new realism for Irish cinema. I'm wondering, is, was did you have much interest in ever try actually making a documentary? Or was there always a feeling of making fiction of the real things that you saw around you? Um, yeah, it wasn't documentary esque. Like I, I was, I grew up with like you know the French New Wave films, Italian neo realism, watching all this stuff, Russian cinema, uh, and some of my favorite filmmakers then from the nineties would have been Shane Meadows, Alan Clark, and and they had similar like you know Ken Loach and they had that kind of social realist aspect and. 
but you know, I wanted to kind of like what I was interested in was was making it organic to to my background. So you know, bringing in stories about like a lot of the characters might be based on my auntie, uncle, my mother. Like between the canals, it wasn't my life, but it was the friendship of my friends growing out, hanging out on St. Patrick's Day. So it was a lot of personal stuff that came into it. But what what I really want was interested in was making it myself, like Irish kind of, and having traditional music, you know, um, because you know that's that's the culture that you know we've grown up in here, and and that's kind of like my my mother was very into you know Luke Kelly and you know and, and all this Irish music, um, growing up. Um, so it kind of worked its way organically in, and it ended up being like a completely traditional mu Irish music soundtrack for Between the Canals. And then I took that into King of the Travellers. It was, it was all traveller music, like Margaret Barry and the Furies. And I was very lucky to, to get to sound, to sound, a full soundtrack you know, of traveller musicians. And, and, and Johnny Cash, actually, as well, uh, was on that, yeah. <laughs> his connection to the Travellers. But um, so, so, so that, that kind of just all came about you know, very just organically. But, um, as well as that, your movies, they, they don't necessarily, as uh, Paul was saying, they might have an anti-hero or people on the edge with crime and so on, but there's a good comedy in there, you know, there's there's fun characters, even though they might be doing something that is uh, untoward, they're having a, you know, they're, they're enjoying life, they're having a, like, especially in between the canals, there's a lot of comedy going on in that movie as well, like, you know, there's, there's some very good scenes. So, I suppose, in, in essence, do you find with your films that, it necessarily because it's an Irish movie it doesn't have to be all dour and oh no this is so terrible you know we're living in here and we're in poverty and so on you're, you're kind of putting the real life on screen or you're kind of getting the, the spirit of, of, of you definitely have the spirit of the of that area of Dublin down the, near Sheriff and so on in between the canals sure. for sure and um, you know that, that it's it, your, your realism is going beyond this um, oh woe is me Ireland you know the cinema that we've had for so long like yeah, I'm not from Sheriff Street, but my mother used to bring me into town to Sheriff Street in Summer Hill. She, I think she was doing Meals on Wheels. I was only a kid, so when when uh, Foot and Mouth walks up to the lad and he goes, "Do you want some ham?" Like that that happened to me because I was with my mother. I was waiting outside some flats, and he, the lad came up and started trying to sell me ham. So it was like it was just it was just stuff that kind of happened along the way. But the comedy was completely accidental because, like, you know, <laughs> which sounds terrible, but like I, was, I remember being in Galway at the flat and people started laughing up between the canals and I was like, well, that, that wasn't was a joke. joke. Yeah, that was meant to be a joke. <laughs> no, yeah, we had it, like people were laughing and then it happened with King of Travers and then I just kind of accepted it that people were are laughing at, uh, you but, know. But there's levity in the darkest of situations. I mean, there's always somebody laughing at a, at a funeral. You know, there's someone yeah. back taking the piss out of someone that died two days ago. I think it's Irish. There. I think Irish psyche is very like, you know, look at the weather out there. So, like when you go to Galway Film Festival, you'll notice like the, the, I remember bringing there was a lot of American students that came over and they what they sat through and they just said the films were so dark here. You know why? Like they wanted to know why. Why there was no happy depressed. ending? Happy ending like in every American <laughs> film ever made. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the opposite <laughs> problem. Um, but yeah, I think like you do need to have like the lighter moments like and, and we're, we're, we're hopefully making a feature film in November so and it's actually set in the homeless community so and it's quite dark but we've looked at the comedy because there's comedy in there and it's, it's interesting to add that in you know and make the character kind of yeah I mean you look at for example the you know the overwhelming problem we have with homelessness in, in this city in particular I mean, someone's reality, no matter what it is, I'm sure that they have to, they find ways and structures to get through the day, you know? So there would be unintentional comedy in that, reflected in, 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 in their life, you know, in, their, in the prism of their reality, you know? There would be. Yeah, so you have to try and find that. If, that mir if any of that type of stuff mirrors what you see in its personal experience, then it's authentic and it's real. And it is funny because it's unintentionally funny sometimes, but you need that, it's in everything needs to be in everything, right? Yeah, and, and I think that goes with, like, say, for instance, a gangster film. It's so essential to a gangster, to a crime film. Yeah. You know, Joe Pesci is extremely funny in, in Goodfellas because you can't just have all the doom and gloom and the violence without yeah. another side to it, you know? And sometimes that can be glorifying us, but, you know, that's why the Italian mafia films are so powerful. They work so well because they've got the suits and all that and the glamorous lifestyle but they've got this really funny humour that runs through yeah. and I think Ireland has that as well in our humour you know and I think that that should be reflected more yeah I mean you 
have to, like we, we, we take the piss out of each other. It's in everything, right? Um, so, what advice and tips would you go give to people? Um, or I suppose yourself, just to simplify it. If uh, at the start of your journey, what advice would you give yourself and your own life experiences if you were starting to make your first shorts? Yeah, like I, I would do things very differently to be honest. Um, now, of what I've like, I've spent the whole of COVID just researching all about distribution. Um, I think it's the most important aspect of filmmaking at the moment. Now, this is if you're making features, you know. Sure. There's ways to sell your film now that that are not being done. Like instead of just handing it over to a distributor, and basically they spend fifty grand on marketing, you never see anything, you know. There's ways to make money now from independent cinema, which is really interesting, you know, like Film Hub and, and Tubu and you know, all these different places. Like you can get your film with, up with, say, Film Hub, and they will, you know, it, it, it gets put up on a platform, and all these different places uh, get to, you know, buy it there. And then you can check the stats of, who, of how much you're going to make from each month. So, but I think the future of that is going to be AVOD. So, at the moment, at like Netflix is, is like SVOD, you know, so that's um, streaming, you know, and then there's, there's transactional, which is TVOD, um, where you buy or rent a film. But the future is definitely AVOD, it's, it's ad revenue. It's okay. where, where your film gets broken down into sections and then you're earning money from the, like, like YouTube. Like TikTok, but, like everything that's it, broken down into Yeah, this. and that, that's, good. that's the future of cinema revenue. Like if you want to be an independent filmmaker, that's the way forward. I'm not saying YouTube yet is at that stage. I think you're much better to, because film should be paid for, like you shouldn't just put it up there for free, like unless it's 10 years old. But, but places like Film Hub are incredible now for independent filmmakers to actually be in control of their IP, you know, and, and to be able to make money. That's actually one or two of the long-term projects that FNI is working on. We have a crowdfunding software that we're uh, kind of pi piloting. So we fundraised for one film, three and a half grand recently, and we didn't take any um, any subsidy or commission on that. So if anybody's working on something outside of that, and they want a bit of a hand, and we'll also put the weight of FNI behind that in terms of our social media channel and our reach, um, we're, we're happy to talk to people about that. If it's suitable uh, in terms of the tone and stuff, what we're trying to, um, what we're trying to market in terms of F and R, um, you know, and also, do you think Ireland needs its own? Now I know there's, they have channels like the Irish Film Board channel, and there's a couple of other places for shorts, uh, for features uh, that you can buy online on YouTube and Netflix and everything else. But does there need to be a short hub of like a, a hub for film making shorts where people can buy and and and, get, and receive revenue for their for the play for their plays for their short form content. I mean there needs to be something like that. The, 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 yeah, country. there should be. You like know, short of the week or Amletto, but you know, something that's Irish. It's not just all Irish film board shorts, but like the best of shorts. You know? That's exactly what we what we need. You know, uh, like there, there's the Film Network Ireland who are good and they support uh, you know short films and stuff but I feel like you know an independent place needs to be set up to support filmmakers onto a channel where sure. it's one like it's Irish cinema so so then it's not just like you trying to put, put your own YouTube channel out there as an independent filmmaker and people don't know about you whereas if you have one and it's almost like a government thing and all the Irish film hub can go in there and it's the revenue comes directly to the filmmaker you know that that's that's brilliant that's, that's exactly what we need I think um, yeah, like, and there's lots of other different ways of, of funding. Like, obviously, you know, crowdfunding is, is good. There's also something called equity crowdfunding that, that's not happening here in the country that is a really good way to fund your film. If you look in, just look up equity crowd, crowdfunding and it's, you have to apply through, it's like, it's almost like a, for a new business. And you get, you get investors then, and they can be from anywhere in the world. They can invest in your movie when you're raising finance, and you can raise up to two million like doing this, you know. Um, and then there's Web Three funding as well through, you know, um, the blockchain. Like there's guys like Miguel Faust who uh, he just raised four hundred grand, I think, to make this uh, film Cayadita. Uh, he did it through the crypto punks, so crypto blockchain uh, like that. Uh, Al Pacino's daughter, Julie Pacino. She released uh, photographs from the rehearsals, and she she put them up as a set, and they sold, and she raised like seven hundred grand. So there's lots of different avenues for independent filmmakers to raise money at the moment. 
Yeah. Do your homework, know what's out there. Yeah. yeah. It's only, I suppose, collectively, if we find out what is out there that we can put pressure on organizations to make that happen here for us. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. Mark might be around a bit later, are you? Yeah. yeah. So we might, if we, we might take some questions then later, but we're just we're trying to get through the, the, the day's talks. Um, so for now, uh, Mark O'Connor, everyone. Lovely stuff. Um, hi, Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, do you want to come over? Will you get cracking? Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.